Hello, everybody. It is Lady B, and it is Sunday school time. I'm so glad that you have joined me with another awesome Sunday school lesson. This is one of those lessons that you're going to have to kind of decide where you stand about some things because we are going to be talking about the Sabbath. And if you know anything about the church world, not necessarily religion, but if you know anything about the church world, the Christian church world, everybody is not in agreement as to um, when Sabbath, okay, let's not say it like that, not when the Sabbath is, but whether or not we should be observing the Sabbath. Now we're gonna touch on that a little bit, but because that's not the, the crux of the lesson, then we're not gonna get into that too much. And I just pray, you know, we're going to um, look at Colossians a little bit and what Paul said about holy days and so forth. And so I just, I just pray that that's enough for us to kind of be okay if, if we're differing on what day it is that we should be worshiping the Lord. So I thank you so much for joining me um, on today. I want to welcome all of our new viewers all of our new subscribers. I especially want to give a shout out to everyone that's been sending super thanks. I, I appreciate that. I'm so humbled by that. I ask you that you hit the like button. Be sure to subscribe. Be sure to share. Help me to get these lessons out because I truly believe that these are not just Sunday school lessons, but these are words that the Lord is speaking to us, that the word of God is coming to mold us and to make us and especially prepare us for the times that are ahead in this world that we are living in. So let's get into this lesson. First, we're going to pray, then we're going to get into this awesome lesson. Hope you have your Bible and your Sunday school book. If you don't have a Sunday school book, you can follow along with me. I do use the Union Gospel Press lesson. And um, yeah, so let's pray and let's get into it. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. I thank you for everyone that is going to be watching. I pray, God, that you would just give me what to say to your people. Lord, we love to study your word. We love to hear what you have to say to us through your word. Thank you for this time of coming together. Thank you for this time of fellowship. God, I just pray your richest blessings on everyone that will come through this lesson, whether it's for one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, or they watch the whole lesson. God, I pray that at the point that they listen, they will hear exactly what you want them to hear. And so Lord, we bless you and we lift this lesson unto you. And I pray as the teacher that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. We give you all the glory and the honor in your mansion's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So again, we are in the Union Gospel Press Sunday School lesson, the title of the lesson is Healing on the Sabbath. Now, our lesson text is in Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. And as you see there, I have the other synoptic texts there from Matthew and Mark. You know, we've talked before that the synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, meaning they have a lot of similarities because they, they, they see the same. So Matthew and Mark and Luke relate these same two stories of the two times um, that Jesus, not just the two times, but these two times in our lesson that Jesus had a run in, so to speak, with um, the Pharisees. So we know we're gonna be talking about the disciples plucking the grain, during the Sabbath, and then we're going to be talking about Jesus healing on the Sabbath. So this is the Sunday School lesson for April 21st. This is the spring quarter. I can't believe that we are midway, or actually a little more than midway of this month of April. It just seems like the time is just going faster and faster. So at less than a quarter, we are familiar with the fact that this the quarters lesson, we're focusing on the fact that Jesus is the son of God and not just the son of God, but that Jesus is God in the flesh. And so because he is God, he has all authority. And so we have talked about Jesus 
confirming who he was um, because he had power over death. Not only was he able to resurrect, not only did he um, claim deity, but he also um, got it from the cross, um, from the grave himself, which shows that he has all power. And then we're in unit two, where we're talking about the fact that Jesus, we know, is God, and he's confirming his deity by the miracles that he performs. And so the lesson on today is we will be talking about the fact that Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath. He is Lord of all. You know, a lot of times we say Jesus is Lord, but we don't actually like live and think and believe like Jesus is Lord. But we've got to get to the point, and I think we're living in some very crucial times. And so it's going to be important that we are living like Jesus is Lord. And I left this have faith in God um, screen from last month, last week's lesson, because I'm going to keep, keep, keep pounding this, keep, keep going into this. Where's my faith? What do I believe? I know Jesus is God. I know he came in the flesh. I know he was born. I know he died. I know he resurrected. I know he's coming again. But do I know, no, no? Because you know what we believe dictates our behavior. And a lot of times we are not really, our, 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 our behavior is not really proving that we really believe we 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 kind of real shaky about a lot of things and i believe that these lessons are coming to help us to get to the point that we are anchored that we are rooted that i know that my redeemer lives that i know that jesus christ is is in me that i know greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world and i'm stressing this because we're really convinced about the I'm supposed to get blessings and I'm supposed to have riches and I'm supposed to be the head and not the tail. You know, we're real convinced about that. But when the enemy really comes against us or when we have to stand for our faith, I think that's when our knees buckle and our our mouths get dry and our, our, our mind goes blank when it really comes down to us given a defense of our faith. And this is why it is so important. When we look at the disciples, they knew whom they believed in. That's what Paul said he was persuaded. He knew he who he believed in. And we have to be convinced that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. This is all of this really boils down to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, winning souls for Christ. That's what all of this is really supposed to be about. So let's look at our golden text. And it says, and he said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So this is Jesus talking, talking to the uh, people, to the scribes and the Pharisees and all the people that were challenging him. All the people that were challenging him. And he said, I am Lord of all of this stuff that, that you think that you have power and control of. I am Lord of that. Our lesson at a glance, Jesus was thoroughly Jewish and he kept God's commandment for the Jewish people, including the Sabbath. I, I want to, I want to, I got to stress this. I got to stress this. We're living in a time that people don't like rules and they don't like standard and they don't like order. And, you know, if you, if you, if you have a church what there's there's a dress code or, or some other type of expectation or requ requirement people they lose it but jesus never violated the law he never violated the law so now if jesus who is the lord and god of the law followed the law followed standards followed rules submitted itself to his parents why do we think that we don't have to submit to anybody. We don't have to follow anybody. Nobody can tell us anything. That's a problem. And, and you know, people talk about 
um, you're acting like a Pharisee because you may have a rule or a standard. No, that's not what made made what make a person Pharisaical. What makes a person Pharisaical is when they leave God out of what God established. Okay, and God established order. God established standards. God established rules. And so when we honor God and we are in order and there is a chaos, then we honor. God. So let's get back to our lesson at a glance. So he attended the synagogue on the Sabbath in keeping with the way it was observed in his time. Yet he became involved in disputes with other Jewish groups about what was and was not permitted on the Sabbath. The fourth commandment stipulated that no work should be done on the Sabbath. And you'll find that in Exodus and Deuteronomy. But, and here's the but, the Bible, the commandments do not specify exactly what that work included. We miss the fact that when God establishes uh, something, it's for a greater purpose. purpose. It's not just for us to do something. And remember that God is love and the rules, the standards that he has established, that he has set it is for the benefit of the people that he has called. So remember that again, that the rules and the standards that God has established, it's for our benefit. It's for our good. It's for our safety. And a lot of times because we get grown or like the old folks would say, you know, you're smelling yourself. We think that if the pastor or the teacher or somebody comes and shares the word of God. Now, we're going to talk about this. When they come and share the word of God, if, they, if they're giving us the Bible, and I want to challenge us, preachers and teachers and evangelists and whatever kind of leaders we are, let's make sure that we're showing people the word of God. You know what, sis? Uh, the Bible says, show them where the scripture is. Don't just attack them and you shouldn't do that that's wrong. Show them in scripture, care enough about their soul that they can go and, and look at the word and study the word. They may have to wrestle with it, but let's give them what the word of God says and not our opinion. God bless you, Pastor Annie. Not our, our opinion, not our feelings, not our thoughts, but what the word of God says. Okay, so Jesus used the Sabbath as an occasion for teaching, not only with his words, but also with his actions. Those who came to observe and criticize him found that they were not able to defeat him with arguments. I wonder why. The themes of healing and the Sabbath come together in Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. There is more to the Sabbath than Jesus' opponents understood. There is more to Jesus than they understood. Only Jesus truly understand, understood what the Sabbath was all about. And he left us an enduring lesson. Listen, since God is the one that gave us the laws, that gave us the rules. I, I say this all the time at, at the church where I serve and I lead the women's ministry and I start getting pushback, but nobody can come and say, oh, well, Lady Tara, that's, that's not in the Bible. It's always, I feel, I think what I want. Good evening, says Genevieve, but it's never the scripture. They, they don't bring the word of God to me. And that's the thing. If you're going to cross a standard in your local fellowship, be able to say, but scripture says otherwise. And we're going to talk about traditions and legalism in a minute, but be able to stay with the word of God because the word of God is the standard. That's what we need to be following. Not our opinions, not our feelings, but the word of God. So today's um, aim is to real reveal how traditions became more sacred than the word of God to the scribes and the Pharisees. You know what? Ask yourself, is are the traditions of my denomination more sacred to me uh, than the word of God? There are a lot of people who have high positions in church, but they don't know the word of God. 
and they're beating people upside the head with scriptures and so forth, which is unfair. The word of God is not supposed to be used as a weapon against the people. It's, it's It does bring correction. It does bring rebuke, but it also brings comfort. It also brings strengthening. It also brings encouragement. And if the only time you are lobbing the word of God over the net is to knock somebody down, you are misusing the word. And that is not what it's called for. So the principles to show that God's word can stand on its own and does not need man's rules at it to to it. God doesn't need our help. And unfortunately, a lot of denominations, there's some extra stuff that we've added on. You got to go to church a certain way, a certain day. You got to dress a certain way. You know, you got to give a certain amount of money. And all those things are attached to God's word when it comes to being redeemed to God. And none of those things are of God. And so then the application is to obey God from the heart, not just in outward form. God is not moved if you you don't have any makeup on and your dress is down to your ankles and, and all of that. And you go to church seven days a week. God is not moved by any of that. What God is looking at is our heart. Where is our heart? Because if our heart is towards God, if we love God, then whatever we may be doing or not doing that does not please God, we will hear the spirit of God come to us and correct us and to exhort us. And then because we love God, we'll change. And then there won't be any fighting and none of those things because we love God more than whatever is in this world that we may be holding on to. Now, I said we were going to talk about traditions. You know, a lot of people don't like traditions. I personally like tradition, and it's not because I'm getting older. I think it's through tradition that you find an anchor, you find purpose, you find meaning. You know, when you talk to younger people now, they have no point of reference where, as we might be saying, I remember when we used to sing, blah, 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 blah. I remember, and the young people now, everything is just wild and, and loose and they, they do anything and they go anywhere and they listen to anybody and there's no, but you know, when you look at the Old Testament, God always told Israel, remind your children, remind your children so they don't lose, so they will remember, so they don't get lost so that they'll remember, so that they won't forget, so they won't get lost. And a lot of our children, we're so busy uh, trying to appeal to them and, and, and make them happy and so forth that they're the most miserable people in the world. Our children, if you look at them, they're always bored. They're always tired. They're lazy. They don't want to do anything. And a lot of that is because we've given them all this stuff, but we've not given them foundation. We've not given them tradition. We've never, we've not given them meaning. It used to be family traditions. This is what the Browns do on this day. And this is what the, 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 the Johnsons do on this day or whatever. And this is what the Smiths do. We have to go back to tradition. Now, when you look at this chart here, it says traditions are good. Are they good or are they bad? It depends. So now this is what's right. If it's synonymous with the word of God, like for instance, we take communion, okay? That is in the word of God. We have been commanded to take, take communion. And when we do that, we're doing it to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay? So that is a doctrine. But now it is wrong if we say, if you don't take communion every Sunday, all right, then you're going to hell. Now that is wrong. That's man's tradition. The Bible doesn't tell us. Jesus just said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. He didn't say do it every week, do it every day. He didn't say that. So some people like, you know, I came up, communion was first Sunday. At the church where I fellowship, we have communion first Sunday. We do it first Sunday morning. Some churches, they only do communion once a year. Some churches do it every Sunday. So the fact that you do it, that's right. And that is a tradition. That's what we do. Your church's tradition may be every Sunday. Your church's tradition may be every year. That is right. But if you attach 
man to that. If you don't do it every Sunday, you're going to hell. If you don't do it every Sunday, you're not part of Jesus Christ's church. Now that is wrong because now that is man's tradition. Now, if you are somebody that says, you know what? The Bible says take communion. And at this church, this is the standard of this church. You are required to take communion every third Sunday if you're going to be a member of this church. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. And people will get upset. That's not a God. And that listen, that, that, that's, not, that's not a problem. If you don't want to take communion on third Sunday, you want to take communion on first Sunday, or you want to take communion every Sunday, then don't go to the church that has communion on third Sunday. It's it's really that simple. They're not saying you're going to hell. They're just saying, this is what we feel like God has given us to follow. So we do communion on third Sunday. We ask everyone, if you're going to be a part of this body to um, follow this rule and take communion on third Sunday. And if you're going to be at that church, you take communion on third Sunday, because remember, there's no law. There's no scripture. There's no doctrine about what day to take it. Now, the early church was doing it the first day of the week. Okay. So, but the Bible doesn't say you have to take it on the first day of the week. So again, if it's in the Bible, clear in the Bible, take communion. We do that. That becomes a tradition that we do that. It is a tradition for a lot of people that they do it on first Sunday, first day of the week. Okay. There are some people that say, if you don't take it every Sunday, if you don't do it this way, you're going to hell. Now, that is wrong. That is bad because that's not in the Bible. And then the neutral one is a particular church may have it third Sunday. And they say, as members of this church, this is what we require. There is nothing wrong for a particular body to have a standard, to have an expectation. And a lot of people get this um, legalism and everything twisted around. No, if they're clearly saying this is the expectation of this church, we're not trying to dictate to other churches. This is the expectation of this fellowship. Then everyone a part of that fellowship should do that. And then God is pleased. God is honored. Everything else is we just are bringing in a lot of confusion. And that is not of God. Praise the Lord, Pastor. That is not of God. We have got to get to the point that we understand the difference between what the word of God says, that we make a tradition, and what man has added on. And whenever we add on to salvation, then we have a problem. Now, this is, as we get into this, this is where we're going to find an issue. And we got to remember this, you all. There's a difference between the method and the message, okay? There's a difference between the method and the message. As times change, your method may change, but the message never changes. But what we have to do is make sure, let, let me go back to this right quick, okay? What we want to do is whatever we establish, whatever we establish, let's make sure that it's not violating scripture. Okay. Let's make sure that it's not violating scripture. Let me give you a good example. A lot of people like to say things like, you know, Jesus said, come as you are. And so then when they come before God in the house of God, some people look like they just got out the club or off the corner. That is not what the Bible is talking about. And so if you have a standard of dress, and you ask the people, not just the women, but you ask the people to dress modestly. You ask the people, you know, when you're coming on Sunday, wear your best. Let's let's carry ourselves like we are coming before the Lord. OK, now, when you do that, now you're being legalistic. No. So that's not what we're saying. So when we look when we look at at this tradition and when we look at the method and the, me and, the and the message, the message of Jesus Christ never changes your method with your times it's got to change i'm at, at my age they didn't have all this digital technology and so forth and so i have to change the other preachers have to change and you know some of us old fogies we don't want to learn a computer we don't want to learn how to text and and email and all that kind of stuff well 
you know, then you're going to be behind the times and you're going to miss some souls, especially the young people, because the way people communicate has changed. It used to be that just mainly the young folk was texting, texting, texting. Now everybody texts and everybody emails and so forth. And so if you get become a stick in the mud and refuse to change, you're going to be ineffective in ministry. But in our changing of the methods, we have to make sure that we are not violating the word of God, the standards of God. There is never the right time to violate the word of God. And a lot of times what's happening is we are changing the message with the methods. And that's a problem. There's a good movie out that my husband and I watched. And the name of this is Seven Deadly Words. And it is about a church who was stuck the church was dying they didn't have very many members left and they were stuck because when people would try to come with new ideas and and new thoughts and so forth they would say we've never done it like that before and so we don't want to be as we look at the pharisees that was part of the problem they were stuck on what their rules were and 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 there are people that are stuck they're stuck on rules they're stuck on traditions that didn't come from god that no longer work and People are dying. Souls are dying. You know, we don't do that at this church. Well, that's why your church is dying. You know, these young people, they just want to just bring all that work, stuff, uh, bring the world into this church. Well, not necessarily. It may not be the world. And so that's where we, especially as older folk, we got to get with God and really and really talk to him and have him lead us and guide us. God, how do I win this new generation? How do I win these people that are speaking slang and stuff that I have no idea what they're talking about? You know, we've got to be willing to listen, to really hear and to really seek God so that he will show us how to reach the people. You know, we are very familiar with this scripture. But Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, told them this parable, no one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wine skins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured no, new wine must be poured into new wine skins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. So there is a difference with things. And so what we have to do is really be sensitive. If, if you know, like in, in, with the children of Israel, if the cloud is shifting, we got to shift with the cloud. We can't stay with the old. I remember when when uh, the church where I, I served, when we were blessed with, with property and members were saying, well, I'm not going. The Lord didn't tell me to go there. Well, come on now, y'all. Come on now. That's, you know. If, if God is moving, because a lot of times people are saying what they're going to do, what they're not going to do, but they haven't even really said, God, is this you? Are you moving? You know, we, we get so caught up in ourselves and what we think and what we feel. And I have the Holy Ghost and you don't tell me because God, no, it needs to be God. Here I am. I'm your servant and I'm going where you're going. So just like Jesus was saying, I know. And I love how this last part is, it talks about the old is better. See, this is the thing, everything, you don't throw out everything. That's where tradition comes from. But there is a time when you gotta shift. It's kind of like if you try to paint the wall, it could be the same color, but it may not be the same batch or the, the, the wall color has gotten dirty and faded faded. And so when you put the paint on there, you can tell the difference. And so that's the same thing when it comes to this, the, to the church, things are changing and people of God, if you're not willing to flow with the times and realize, well, you can't do that anymore, or you can't do that anymore. I tell the Sunday school teachers at my church, these kids are used to playing games and watching TV all day. So you can't expect them to focus on you talking for 30, 40 minutes. You got to hit that lesson hard. 
10 minutes of, of the lesson and then you got to get some activity or something going. You cannot and, and, and you want to be mad at them. These kids are bad. They don't know how to listen. They don't want to sit out. No, we're dealing with a different generation. We're dealing with a generation that their minds day and night are doing like this. And so you have to be wise enough to realize how do I keep these students of this time period engaged? This is not the time when, like with me, you sat there and you shut up and you listen, and it is what it was. No, these kids now, they're used to talking and expressing themselves, and they're being taught things that God knows I would have never been taught in my time. And so I have to ask God. Message is the same, but God, I need a new method because this is a different, this is a different generation. All right, and so then this is a note I got from the King James Study Bible. Same text, but this was about Mark. Divine institutions on earth are to have a God honoring noble and liberating function. Sabbath laws have for some degenerated into a mockery of God's intent. Jesus, the son of man and Lord of the Sabbath, having power to forgive sins, can also teach rightly regarding proper observance of the Jewish Sabbath. And then they go on to say, Jesus here touches a raw nerve as the next incident, and we know that was going to be the healing of, of the man, is going to show us. Now, whenever word of God comes, it should not hit a nerve. It should not make us mad. And this is why I'm saying, what do we really believe? Do we really have faith in God? Or has have we made this about us and what I think and what I feel and what I want, you know, because I'm the great bishop and I'm the great evangelist and I'm the whatever, you know, we got all these titles now, but we don't really know God. We don't really believe God and, and saying to God, there's a time coming. And I think it's sooner than later. It's not going to matter what our title is. We're going to have to know God, like know him in, in a real sense, not just within the confines of our denomination where everybody has stroked us and told us we were great and so anointed. But if they stop us from going to church and if they stop us from, from being able to come and go as we please as a Christian, am I still going to be able to stand? Do I knew the, know the word of God? Because, you know, in the world, they don't care anything about you being an apostle. They don't care anything about you getting your praise on. They don't care about you being the queen or the king or the head or the foot or none of that. The world cares nothing about that. So do we know God enough? Are we in him enough that whatever God allows in our lives, we will be able to stand and be an example. And the Pharisees were having problems with Jesus because he was rocking their boat. He was rocking their, their security and they didn't like that. So let's look at the Pharisees. We don't know exactly the origin, but the name means separated. Um, it's not mentioned in the Old Testament. We know this occurred. They became um, um, common and popular during the intertestamental period, during the Maccabean period. And, but we do have them mentioned a lot in the New Testament. Josephus says that at their zenith, that means at their peak of popularity, they numbered more than 6,000. They were strict. They were a strict religious group of Jews who advocated. I can't read y'all. Who advocated minute? That word is not minute at this point right here. Minute obedience to the Jewish law and traditions. They were very influential in the synagogues. They formalized the religion of the scribes and placed it into practice. They believed in the resurrection of the body. They believed in heaven, hell, the existence of angels and spirits. They rejected Jesus' claim to be the Messiah because he did not follow their traditions. Oh, I remember, and I, I repent of this now, but you know, the Lord put somebody in my life and they became my prayer partner. But because of the way I was taught, I just didn't believe she was saved because she wore lipstick and she wore a pants. So I just knew I'd be like, oh, she's the nicest person in the world. And it seems like she really loves God, but she's not saved because she wears pants and she wears lipstick. And this is what the Pharisees were feeling. And that's what some of us are stuck that, you know, we're judging people because they don't have the same belief system that we do, but they believe in the same Christ we do. And remember, nowhere in scripture does it say if you wear lipstick or you wear pants or something, this other stuff we add on, then you are not saved. We made that up. God never said that. 
Okay, so let's keep reading this. He did not follow the traditions and he associated with notoriously wicked people. Remember, they were so holy that there were certain people they did not associate with. So by the time of Christ, the Pharisees had developed a system of 613 laws. Now, these were oral laws that were on top of the written law. So 365 of them were negative commands, thou should not. And 248 of them were positive laws, thou shalt. Now, when you see this rock or this pack on the man, and this is what Jesus said. Jesus said that these laws that the Pharisees had come up with, they were so burdensome that they were weighing people down they had so many laws even the pharisees couldn't keep them and that's why jesus had problems with the pharisees and then there were the scribes the scribes were a class of learned men who made the systematic study of the law and its exposition their professional occupation the scribes of the pre-exilic days were public writers governmental secretaries and copiers of the law as well as other documents and then we know in the book of ezra he was one of them the majority of the scribes belonged to the Pharisee party. Some were Sadducees, zealous defenders of the law and true teachers of the people. They were called rabbi, meaning my master, my teacher. They were known as lawyers. And because of their legal knowledge, scribes are often called upon to serve as judges in Jewish courts. The decisions of leading scribes became oral law or tradition. So they were following what the scribes had said the law meant. Okay. So if the scribe said this is what the law meant, then that's what it was. This is just for information. I'm not going to um, go over this long. The Jewish scripture, they have the law, they have the prophets, and then they had the writing. So when you, when you hear Jesus talking about the law and the prophets, this is what it is, the former prophets and the latter prophets. And as you notice, these are they're laid out differently than we have in our Bible. So it's the law, the prophets, and the writings. And so we know that the oral law is a tradition explaining the written Torah and how to interpret it and apply the law. So Orthodox Jews believe God taught the oral law to Moses and he taught it to others and then he passed it down to the present day. And this tradition was maintained in all form only until about the second century CE when the oral law was compiled and written down in a document called the Mishnah. And that's where you also see um, the scribes. All right. So I want to talk about this real quick. Around the original Sabbath law of Moses, 39 prohibitions have been laid down in the oral law. So I want you to think about that. God gave the Sabbath law through Moses. And then the, the people, the Pharisees had added 39 other prohibitions. Okay. And then around these 39, a vast number of smaller rules have been grouped themselves. So God's law then 39 more laws, and then some more laws. And then amongst these greater and lesser Sabbath restrictions were prohibitions against reaping and threshing. Now, plucking ears of corn was defined to be a kind of reaping. So if you touch the corn and you, and you pull, because you know, you're only going to get enough for you to eat. The Pharisees had made that into a law that that was reaping and that was working on the Sabbath. So again, plucking of ears of corn was defined to be a kind of reaping and rubbing the ears in the hands and a kind of threshing. So you, you pull the ear of corn off, that's reaping, okay? And if you rub it in your hands to get the husk off so you could just eat the grain, that was threshing. Now, threshing, if you're familiar, threshing is when they take that pitchfork and throw it up in the air so the wind will catch the chaff and then just the grain will fall. So they had like we say, doing the most. This, just taking it and rubbing in my hands, they considered that threshing and they considered that violating the Sabbath law. So let's look at this right quick. We're moving quickly. So legalism is the strict adherence or the principle of strict adherence to law or prescription, especially to the letter, letter rather than the spirit. A lot of times we take scripture and we take law and we just choke people. We just choke them. I remember my sister shared that when she 
was in the military, she was overseas and she knew she needed to get back in church. But when she would get off work, she would have pants on and they wouldn't let her, you know, be at church because she had pants on, which mattered more, her soul getting right with God or the pants that we had on. And that's what we're saying about the legalism. With the legalism, we miss the letter of the law. Now, I'm going to say this again. There is a difference between a person that may not have the proper attire and they come into the house of the Lord and you're patient with them and you're loving with them. That's not the same thing as you just rebellious and you're going to do what you want to do. That's not and you know, when if somebody says something to you, you want to throw in their face, they're being legalistic. No, that's not what we're talking about. Because remember the chart about tradition. The Bible is clear about us dressing modestly. So when you first come to Christ, let's say you were, you know, on the street. When you first come to Christ, you may not know. So somebody needs to love you and be patient enough with you until you learn. But once you learn and you just being stubborn and have the attitude, you don't tell me. Now that's a pharisaical spirit. Okay. Not having rules and a standard. That's not the pharisaical spirit. When we are refusing to submit to what Jesus has established in his written word, that's a pharisaical spirit. So here we go again, legalism. Legalism is the enemy of Jesus Christ. Legalism is where people take the scriptures and they add to it. John Piper despise, defines one aspect of legalism as treating biblical standards of conduct as regulations should be kept by our own power in order to earn God's favor. So again, I can't be holy. So going to church on Sunday, wearing a certain thing, giving an amount of money. That's me and my flesh. That's legalism. A legalist is anyone who behaves as if they can earn God's approval and forgiveness through personal performance. That's legalism. We cannot do it. Now, here, even today, we have people that say you cannot understand the Bible without the oral law. They say it. I've been there. And what I mean by that is I know that there are pastors, I've experienced it, that tell people you need me to understand the scriptures. You need me to understand what God is saying. I hear from God for you. And that is not what God ever is established. What else would you like me to teach you about God's word? And look at what this poor lost soul has the Bible and, the, and they're being told, don't know, don't read the Bible. You just do what I say. That's a problem. And that's what is going on. That's what was going on with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were not concerned about the people's souls. They were concerned about themselves and their position. And they wanted the people to stay lost. They wanted them to stay sheep so that they can continue to feel important. Let's remember that there's only one gospel message. And that good news is that Jesus came he lived, he died, he was resurrected, he ascended, and he's coming again. That's all. That's it. There's nothing else. And remember, we talked about this last quarter. Paul said, do not anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. So we're not supposed to be condemning one another with what day you go to church and what you observe and what you don't observe. And we're also supposed to not be adding on to stuff for salvation. It's if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, God has raised him from the dead. You're going to be saved. That's salvation. All the other stuff is man. When we talk about the Sabbath, this fourth commandment, when we talk about the Sabbath. Isaiah 58, 13 says, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thy own words. Now, what was God saying through Isaiah to Israel that just the Sabbath day was supposed to be my day, the day that you reflect on me, but it did not mean it was not a day that you reached out and that you helped and you demonstrated love and you acted like you belonged to me. That is not what it was supposed to be. All right, last scripture I want to share. Jesus told the disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, Okay, that's the scribes, the teachers of religious law. 
are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So he did not the work, but he did say, practice what they what they teach it because that came from me. But don't follow their example. And I don't know about you, but I do not want God to say that about me. Don't follow Tara's example. I don't want to just teach the scripture, but I also want to live the scripture. Okay, we're almost done here. So after we put all that together, so we understand what the Pharisees are, we understand what their standard was, and I love, you can just see the anger, I just love pictures, you know, I love visuals. Okay, so they were looking for Jesus to do something wrong. So that already is a violation. So, you know, you're on Jesus about the Sabbath, but your heart is not right towards him. And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the cornfields and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? Now, I just got to ask a question. It's the Sabbath. Why are they out there? Do you see what I'm saying? We're so busy um, trying to catch other people violating one of our laws that we find ourselves violating, violating laws too. No, let's not be like that. And Jesus said to them, have you not read so much as this, what David did when himself was hungered and they which were with him, how he went into the house of God and did take and eat the showbread and gave also to them that were with him, which it is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone. And he said unto them that the son of man is Lord also of the Sabbath. What was Jesus saying to them? Your own king, David, ate the bread that was only supposed to be for the priests. But this is the thing, the bread that they ate, when you go back and read the scripture, the priest said, this bread is holy. Have the men been with women? No, they haven't been with women. Okay, so they can eat the bread. The men had to be holy. But then when it was all said and done, Jesus said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I, the son of man, am Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, Jesus was saying, I instituted the Sabbath. So since I instituted the Sabbath, I can determine what the Sabbath standard is. Man doesn't do that. I do that. And that's what they were not understanding. And, you know, they didn't even have a heart to really even understand what God was saying. They only knew that they wanted their laws done. Now, when Jesus called himself the son of man, what does son of man mean? It is a title, his title of humility. He left heaven's glory and took on human flesh. The title of deity. Jesus is the supreme example of all that God intended mankind to be. All the fullness of a Godhead in bodily form. Fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus claimed for the high priest to be the son of man was a reference to the prophecy of Daniel 7, 13 to 14. Jesus also spoke of his coming kingdom. The son of man and fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy will be the king. So when Jesus was saying he is the son of man, what was he saying? All that you're expecting. I'm the one that you've been expecting. I'm the one that's coming to die for you. I'm the one that's going to judge you. And so because of who I am, I can determine what the Sabbath means. And God had always determined, if you go back and look at the Old Testament, the Sabbath was never an issue about you just being in your house and not doing anything, but it was to enjoy God. It was to fellowship with God. It was to fellowship with others. That's what the Sabbath was supposed to be. But it was not meant for them to be walk, walking around and trying to catch Jesus violating one of their rules. They they wanted Jesus to follow their rules. Jesus doesn't follow anybody's rules because he is God. So let's keep going here. We're almost done. And so then we have in the next part, and it says, and it came to pass also on another Sabbath. So Jesus, they got mad at Jesus because the disciples had gotten the grain and they accused them of threshing and, and harvesting and so forth. And Jesus was saying that, no, I'm the Lord.
Jesus was saying that I'm the Lord. I'm the Lord and I am the God, okay? So here's another Sabbath. And what were they doing again? Once again, they're looking for Jesus, okay? <laughs> they're looking for Jesus. They're trying to find a problem with Jesus. And so on another Sabbath, he entered into the synagogue and he taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees, they were watching him. They were watching him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts. And he said to the man, which had the withered hand, rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking round about them all, he said unto the man, stretch forth thy hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored whole as the other. And they were filled with madness and commune one with another what they might do to Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this scripture here. Here this man is with the withered hand. And they are so consumed with their laws and their traditions that you can imagine just even how dark their hearts were at this point i really don't believe that they were even looking to keep their laws so that uh they could please god it was all about them it was all about this power that they had and they didn't like the fact that jesus was challenging their authority and their power because when jesus spoke people listened and the people were following him and jesus was healing something they could not do and jesus was delivering something they could not do and they didn't like that and so they were looking for a reason that's why when when they finally got to the point where they were able to get Jesus crucified. They couldn't find anything on Jesus. So what did they do? They made up stories and they lied. They they lied on Jesus because Jesus, there was nothing they could find on him. But just think about this. Here are the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, the scribes who are interpreting the law. And they are mad because they can't find anywhere where Jesus has violated the scripture in, in, in their minds because the man stretching out his hand to be healed was a violation of the law. That to them was work. But remember what Jesus said this is in luke 14 and 5 he said to them if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the sabbath day will you not immediately pull it out look at what jesus is saying now you are mad at me because i'm healing this man this man is sick this man who you should care about as a religious leader listen people got I'm going to keep challenging us as the Lord keeps challenging me. It's not enough that we go to a particular church and we have a title and people within those four walls know us. Are we taking this healing power of Jesus Christ out to the masses, out to the community and reaching out to them and sharing the love of Jesus with them? That's what really matters. These Pharisees were not concerned about 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 this man they were just concerned about whether jesus was gonna violate their law that's that's the only thing they were concerned about but jesus challenges them he said but now if you have an ox or a child that falls into a ditch and they would put these ditches around their vineyards and so forth so that nobody could come you know, there's their 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 flock, so nobody could come and and steal their their livestock. So when the person would come, they would fall into the ditch, and sometimes the animal would fall in there. And so they say, if your animal gets stuck and it's on the Sabbath, you want me to believe that you're not going to go rescue your because the animal was money. Go rescue your your animal or go rescue your child. Is that what you want me to believe? And so Jesus is saying, because I'm the Son of Man. Why would I not rescue my child? This person here with this withered hand is from the seed of Abraham. Okay? My beloved. So why would I not heal him? Just like you would rescue your child, I'm going to rescue my child. But then look at it again. What work did Jesus do? He didn't exert himself. All he said was, be healed. That's all he said. But when we are angry, and all we're seeing is red. We can't hear from God. 
we can't function right. And that's where the scribes and the Pharisees were. But we have to remember that God is Lord above our denomination and our belief systems and all those things. He's Lord and God above all that. God really doesn't care if we don't agree with it or we don't like it. You know, all that matters is what God wants and that it's going to glorify him. OK, so I want to challenge us. I want to challenge us. There is a difference between religion and relationship. There's a difference between religion and relationship. The scribes and the Pharisees, they had religion and they had religion on top of religion and tradition on top of tradition. And they had so much layered on the law that you couldn't even see the law for all of their rules that they had. Just like the, the wedding feast of Cana. That's why they had so many water jars there because they had to wash and 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 wash. And none of that came from the law. It all came from um, it all came from the, the Pharisaical oral laws. OK, and that's what we want to stay away from. So as I close, religion is a system of rules and conduct. It has religious formula and ceremony. It relates to hierarchies and position as organization has practice and observance. Now, I'm going to say again, I am not against religion. I'm against religion that tries to supersede God. There's where I have my problem. We should have a relationship. A relationship is a transformational lifestyle, a new desire to worship, worship that becomes internal, conduct that is changed by con conviction, not just rules, okay? Because I, I went to a very dogmatic church, but the people were still sinning because it wasn't in their hearts. We live to please someone else. And who is that someone else? That someone else is God. And then we have a disciple lifestyle. We have a disciple lifestyle. So and I was like that. I went to church and I didn't want to dis, 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 um, displease my pastor. I didn't want to displease my mother. And then what did God do? He uprooted me and moved me someplace where it was just me and him. So I had to develop my own relationship with God, not based upon rules and what people thought or what they felt, but I was doing it because I love the Lord, because I was saved, because I was in relationship with God. And this is what we have to do. People of God, we have work to do. And sometimes we are dealing with people and, and I, I need you all to really hear me because I do not believe in fighting leadership because you have a bad attitude and you're defiant and you're rebellious. And that is not what I'm saying. But if you find yourself in a situation that you that you have really been praying and you have been seeking the Lord and you've gone to your leadership and you talk to your leadership and, you know, they're like the Pharisees. They're not going to budge. You know, this is this is what we're going to do. And I don't care what you say. You know, this is our tradition. And you really have a burning. You get before God and you pray before God. And if nothing's changing and God leads you, you respectfully go before your leaders and say, you know, I believe that the Lord is shifting me because I have this work to do because we don't want to be bound and caught up in anything that the focus is not what we've been called to do. And that is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is to bring in the harvest of souls because we know that the day is approaching. We know that our redeemer, is, he draws nigh. And so that is my challenge to you. Let's search our hearts. Okay. Don't throw out all the traditions. Don't don't throw out the traditions. Don't. I'm not saying that. You know, if your church wears now I'm talking about the black church. You know, your church wears white every first Sunday. You need to wear that white every first Sunday. I personally think it's beautiful. If you guys have to wear gloves, if if, if you have to wear gloves at communion, you know, regardless of what the, the where it came from, wear the white gloves. Whatever your church's tradition and your church's culture is, I'm, I'm encouraging you to embrace that, love that, because tradition and culture, it's a beautiful thing. It's what anchors us. It's what gives us meaning and gives us purpose as a group of people. But what I am saying is don't take the traditions and the culture and attach 
something to it that tells people if you don't do it exactly like this, then you're not saved, that God doesn't honor you, you're going to hell and all those things. Now that is wrong. That's not what we want to do. And that's what was going on with the Pharisees. They just piling on, piling on, piling on. And Jesus is like, hey, I'm Lord and God of all of this stuff. And I do what I want to do when I want to do it. Why? Because it's always the heart of God to love, to minister, to make whole. That is always the heart of God. It is not God's heart just to have a bunch of rules. The heart of God, these rules are to keep us safe, to strengthen us, to encourage us, to get us ready to meet him. It's always a good thing. All right. So that's all I have. You know, I'm going to keep asking you what you believe. I'm going to keep asking that. Me, who do you believe? As we keep on doing this, God, to be the Lord and God and authority, I'm going to keep asking what do you believe? Who do you believe? But this is so important. This is when you really believe in the true living God is going to keep you from all of this old tradition stuff that keeps you bound up where you no longer care about souls and they could be broken, they could be dying. You don't talk to them because they're not drug writer, they don't spell right, or they're not part of your church, or they have makeup on or pants on, or they pat it up, or they have piercings, or you know, all the stupid stuff that we do. And it really is stupid stuff because God. God is more concerned about souls. He is more concerned about souls. You use wisdom, you don't violate the word of God. But remember, I don't know why I keep wanting to say this, but remember, methods change. The message will never change, but methods do change. Okay, that's all I have. I, I've, I've said enough. I love you all. Thank you again for subscribing and sharing and commenting. Keep hitting that like button. So uh, YouTube will be like, oh, the people like her. So more and more people will hear what God has given me to say. A shout out again to everyone that has blessed me through the super thank yous. I, I really appreciate you so much. We believe God, you be encouraged. You know, our Lord, he's soon to come. I hope you believe that. You know, that's one of the things we're talking about. What do you believe? Our Lord is soon to come. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Bye-bye.